cost of living crisis, right. eat cereal for dinner. But for her to say, come out and vote, and by the way, when I was 22 years old and I had an affair with a married man that I knew was married, the feminist failed me. I'm sorry. I think like, the feminist did to, fail her. Yeah, it was, to was another era. That. She was 22. Mm. We're supposed to have moved on from that. Don't hark back on no. something you did that was wrong. Talk TV. It's the only place where you get the truth. Good morning, everyone, and welcome to the show. I'm Kevin O'Sullivan. And I'm Alex Phillips. We're with you for the next half hour to grapple with the greasy world of news like oiled up MMA fighters. You're with Talk TV on TV, on radio, online, and on your smart speaker. MMA fighters, eh? Let's uh, fight our way through 30 <laughs> thrilling minutes of the big headlines of the day. And the first story we're going to cover now only happened four hours ago. The most mm. extraordinary disaster. Uh, a cargo ship sailing out of Baltimore Harbour here we see, hit the Whoa, bridge, and that bridge with cars and people on it collapsed like a sardine can. That is, uh, we're told, one of the world's longest truss steel bridges, so it's a bridge of a certain kind. It's been there for some time. It's called the Francis Scott Key Bridge. Uh, 20 people are missing, at least. Cars have gone into the river. Uh, and uh, one particular captain, I think, is having a very, very bad day. I mean, quite how it managed to collapse when he hit it right over the side, God knows, but what a oh, story. It's astonishing, isn't it? You very rarely see a spectacle like that. These are live like pictures, that. by the way, the, of uh, the rescue I mean, that operation. is costing billions, but what we don't know yet is the cost of lives, the casualties involved. There could be up to 20 people in several vehicles in the water. That's according to Baltimore City Fire Department. Um, but we're not going to be getting more information on that, I wouldn't have thought, until much later in the day. But astonishing, you would think, wouldn't you? I mean, I don't know the sort of relative weights and the forces of uh, these two giant sort of megalithic structures, but the idea that a ship going at whatever speed it's going can take down a whole bridge and not just sort of stop the ship and grind to a halt is utterly astonishing. It does sort of call into question the resilience of that particular structure. Um, but, you know, tra tra absolute tragedy, frankly. This is going to be a huge rebuild in Baltimore. And like I said, we don't know if people have lost their lives. One imagines if there were people on that bridge in, in vehicles at the time uh, and that the reports are suggesting there were, that it'd be potentially quite difficult to survive falling into water in a vehicle. But it's, uh, I mean, it's just astonishing, astonishing pictures. Yeah, indeed. And I know Baltimore a bit and that bridge is uh, crucial uh, to that city. Uh, getting around Baltimore is going to be very, very difficult mm. while they rebuild that bridge. But more pressingly, uh, urgent searches going on of the river there. Uh, and uh, the fire brigade, the police, everyone are there. Uh, as we say, up to 20 people, several vehicles are reported to have fallen into the river. Uh, I, I guess the only good uh, thing about this is the timing. It would have been about 1.30 in the morning local time, so at least it wasn't rush hour traffic or anything like this. But someone, people were on the bridge mm. and the search is now going on uh, of how, the river. How is it when you've got a massive girt vessel like that that you don't know it's not going to fit under that bridge? You know, my dad was a car transporter driver and you know the height of your vehicle and you know the height of every single bridge. And Baltimore is a massive port in America, absolutely vital, a huge sort of artery for cargo going into uh, the East Coast. And you would think that any giant vessels bringing cargo in and out of uh, Baltimore port would, would know whether it could fit under that bridge or not. Uh, indeed. Uh, and it's really weird the way it hits the bridge right at the sort of right-hand side as if they're almost in the shallow end of the river. You might have thought it would go right. through the middle. But anyway, uh, this is all speculation. We'll be bringing you much more about mm, this uh, shocking. massive developing story later in the show on Crosstalk at 1 p.m. And I'm sure uh, others will be covering this as well. Huge story. Mm. Uh, we'll keep you up to speed with it throughout today. Uh, meanwhile, uh, last night, uh, yesterday, uh, Alex, uh, the... Uh, New, the United Nations Security Ca Council, all 14, 14 nations unanimously voted to call for an immediate ceasefire going uh, through Ramadan and leading to a permanent ceasefire. The only 
uh, Security Council nation to abstain, uh, merely abstain, was uh, America. Now, that is mm. a big, a significant changing of the dial because hitherto America had used its right to veto. Today or yesterday, it decided just to abstain, which means this becomes official. The United Nations Security Council is now officially demanding a ceasefire mm. in Gaza. Benjamin Netanyahu has, re has responded by cancelling a delegation trip to uh, uh, the USA yeah. and uh, angrily uh, denouncing America for saying, you've just changed your position. Well, Benny Gantz have. has turned around and said the resolution has no operational significance for Israel and the military will continue to operate in the Gaza Strip on Tuesday. But yeah, this is interesting. It is sort of driving a bit of a wedge between Israel and the United States. A lot of dismay actually in Israel and uh, in the government at the moment, which of course is a coalition government being propped up by very right-wing parties. Um, and people sort of saying, well, look, his uh, Netanyahu's need to appease his coalition partners is actually creating a wedge now between Israel and the United States. Um, but it seems to me that uh, Netanyahu's just saying to the United States, don't care, you've abandoned your previous policy, probably thinking there's going to be a regime change and Trump will be back in anyway, who I think is going to be far more supportive mm -hmm. of Israel's actions there in the Gaza Strip. Important to point out, though, that this resolution also called for the release of of all hostages. So there was a sort of degree of even-handedness to this, basically just saying that this needs to end now. Also, I think important to point out that UK aid for the first time is now being airdropped into Gaza. Yes, uh, the important part of that story, though, is the increasingly frosty relationship between America and Israel, obviously traditionally, historically very close uh, allies, they always work together. Israel never seemed to do anything without mm. getting Washington's permission first. Well, that relationship is disintegrating fast. Netanyahu furious with Biden, just saying we're not coming on this delegation to Washington uh, and you've just changed your policies, you've abandoned mm. us. Uh, and uh, basically, uh, if Hamas released all the hostages, then there might be something to work with here, but they're not going to do that. And yeah. therefore, uh, this is just the United Nations blowing hot air. <laughs> Netanyahu won't do time, anything to change his you know, current If you condition. suffer from something like cancer and you're having chemotherapy, you don't go, well, you know, let's finish chemotherapy and leave some of the cancer lurking around in my body because it's going to yeah. come back. And this is the Israeli argument against Hamas. These are bloodthirsty, highly funded terrorists who are determined to wipe out the Jewish state. And so you leave Hamas in place, you don't manage to completely destroy Hamas, and they will reform. It will only be a matter of time. Right, uh, still with uh, potential enemies, China uh, is responding now to uh, the threat by Britain to label it an official threat to this country. This is because of its cyber attacking activities. To 2021, we're officially mm. now blaming the Chinese for a massive hack uh, which uh, compromised the personal details on social media of 40 million Brits. We're officially blaming Beijing for that. And uh, we're gearing up today uh, to uh, actually uh, officially say that China is a threat to this nation. Yeah. Uh, let's have a listen to uh, the Deputy Prime Minister, Oliver Dowden, in the Commons yesterday. Taken together, the United Kingdom judges that these actions demonstrate a clear and persistent pattern of behaviour that signal, signals hostile intent from China. That is why the United Kingdom has today sanctioned two individuals and one entity associated with the Chinese state-affiliated APT31 group. So we've got here state-backed espionage on an industrial scale, 40 million people's records accessed via the Electoral Commission. What they were looking for were what are called invisible voters. They weren't looking for Kev or me. They were looking for people who work in the intelligence sector, whose details do not appear in any sort of public domain. And they use that to find addresses, track people. They have surveillance, which enables people to be identified simply via the gate of their walk, which is something that can never be altered, apparently, even with surgery. Um, and this state-backed espionage on an industrial scale, one of, you know, numerous crimes, essentially, that China has committed. And what? We've stopped two people from getting on an aeroplane. Yeah, well, That's this it. is... 
This is being seen by uh, many people in politics and indeed around the country as an extremely feeble response by Britain uh, to China, which of course supplies us with so many goods. Uh, so uh, Ian Duncan Smith, one of the people who's been warned uh, that he will be uh, the victim of a big cyber attack by China soon. Several politicians mm. have been warned they're in the frame. Anyway, uh, Ian Duncan Smith, after Oliver Dowden's feeble statement, uh, said this. It is a little bit, this statement, like an elephant giving birth to a mouse. Why too? America has sanctioned over 40 people in Hong Kong. We have sanctioned none, and three lowly officials only in Xinjiang. Surely this means that the integrated review should now be changed. They are not an epoch-defining challenge, strange as that may be, but they are surely a threat, and can they now correct that so that we all know where we are with China? Well, you would think he'd be able to be questioning the Foreign Secretary and all of this, because that's his portfolio, portfolio. But as we know, Lord Cameron of Xi Ping Norton, great friend of Beijing, isn't even elected and can't be held to account by the Commons benches. That, Slow round that, of applause to Rishi Sunak for that, that appointment. But isn't Ian that Duncan wonderful? Smith, very, very angry there. And I think he represent, so. represents the feelings of a lot of people. It's no, no good saying, China, such a threat to us. Look what it did in 2021. Ooh, we're going to tell two people off. Big deal. Either we respond or don't bother. But later today, it may be that the British government officially calls the Chinese government a threat to this <laughs> How country. How can they do that with Lord Cameron as well, the Foreign Secretary? Well, the, well, What's the, he going to do? They don't need Sanction him. himself? We, we don't necessarily need him there. We'll get oh, the Prime we Minister. We don't need him. Well, we you need him like a yeah. bullet in the brain. They can do it without him, and they may well. Uh, right, uh, we have to do it. They have to do everything without him because he's not allowed into the chamber. Make of that what you will. Great, isn't it? Uh, anyway, uh, let's move on to Russia. Now, ISIS, in response... To what I thought was extraordinary Extraordinary uh, yesterday and the day before, Alex, was the way uh, the Russia, they don't mess about. Uh, these people who are charged with uh, being responsible for this terrible uh, terrorist attack on Friday where something like 143 uh, innocent concert goers were shot down in cold blood. Mm. Massive, massive event. Uh, ISIS uh, claiming responsibility for that. Uh, but uh, basically Russia just sort of displayed these people and say, look, we chopped his ear off. Look, this one's, so, this one's so badly beaten up, he can't even see. He's in a wheelchair. Yeah. I mean, they, they not only do they say we've got them, they say, look, yeah. we've tortured them. There's video but, of one being, like, dragged out of a tree and kicked yeah. around. And... In response to this, though, and these people are thought to be Chechens. They're Russian uh, nationals, uh, but they are thought to have been operating well, for the Muslim star. community, as they say. Yeah. It's an Islamist attack, despite what Putin says. Putin says it's Ukraine. That's not true, uh, but he's going to use that as an excuse to attack Ukraine. Uh, it's an ISIS attack, and uh, in response to the uh, displaying of these people who have been tortured, ISIS has said, you know, you don't scare us, and because you've done that, we're going to massacre you. And they are threatening more and more yeah. bloodthirsty attacks. I mean, what's interesting about this branch of ISIS, ISK as it's known, Khorasan, is that uh, they are, well, they've planned a lot of huge attacks. They've had attacks against France that have been foiled. They're planning attacks here in the United Kingdom. It's a new and extra bloodthirsty branch of ISIS. We're pretty unhappy that they think the Taliban in Afghanistan are on the side of the West. Taliban's not enough for them. Uh, they basically have origins in places like old Persia, Pakistan. Uh, they operate largely out of eastern Afghanistan. But what is very interesting about this is, first of all, Putin didn't want to say that it was Islamic State because he's got very cosy relationships with Iran, very important to him. Both regimes backed up by huge sort of state-level uh, religions, one Orthodox Christianity and the well, other, of course, didn't want to say it, so he can invade you, he can, he well, can he wanted attack to use Ukraine. It, no, he wanted to use it for that purpose. But also, when you look at the sort of wider geopolitical picture, there are lots of interests out there who want to drive a wedge between Putin and uh, Iran. Mm -hmm. And um, he's turned around today and basically said, well, these awful Islamists, the poor Muslim world, have to deal with them every day. So but very more clear... More to the point, he said it was his, uh, Ukraine and he's going to attack Ukraine because of it. Uh, let's move well, no, on. Well, no, he's now said it's Islamic State. Yeah. Yeah, so he but, just said, Why but he is going to use it to attack Ukraine. Now, let's talk about Kate 
Uh, the Princess of Wales, there's brave revelation last Friday that she's suffering from uh, cancer, uh, has inspired hundreds of thousands of women to get checked. Uh, so that is good. Cancer charities and the NHS saw a surge in online visitors following Kate's video on Friday. Yeah, so, if only we had an NHS that was able to deal with all of that. Um, but it is quite alarming. You know, it, it sort of brings into sharp focus some sort of strange thing that's happened over the course of the last 30 years, which is the huge uptick in cancers, particularly abdominal cancers, in women under the age of 50. We now have uh, a, a, sort of women in the 30s, 40s, a far higher rate of getting early onset cancers than men. And people don't quite know what's going on. This is happening across the Western world. And I think a lot needs to be looked into. What sort of changes in lifestyle and what is in our water uh, is actually causing the, the rapid growth of cancers in young people. Yeah, it's, huge uh, surge of cancer all over the world in the under 50s and uh, Kate may well be a victim of that so that needs to exa be examined and also uh, one other thing that happened yesterday the London uh, the uh, UK uh, the American ambassador here in London said that Prince Harry will not be deported under Joe Biden uh, Trump has promised that maybe he will be because he might have lied on his uh, visa application. And, uh, of course, the Democrats are supposed to be, you know, the party of the people. They're all three bags full, so yes, sir, yes, sir, you can stay in our country, so we'd be very, very honoured. Donald Trump said, if you lied on your visa, you're out. I'm not looking after you. Here's to Donald, in my in my view. What? Uh, we have to have him back. Uh, yeah, well, there is that. I that's don't a good, want him. That's a good point. They can have Let him. the two orange men both stay in America. Uh, but that, I think he might not if uh, Donald gets in. So interesting. Uh, now let's talk about Johnny Mercer. Johnny Mercer has been given 10 days to name special forces whistleblowers who raised concerns about the alleged executions of Afghans. Uh, and if he does not do that, this of course is during the Afghan war, if he does not do that, he faces a possible jail sentence or a fine. I thought, Alex, that we'd brought in a law to protect whistleblowers if they are revealing important, uh, useful information. Yeah, this is a really astonishing story. Of course, the former veterans minister, um, he has had people report things to him. He doesn't want to give names. He wants says he wants to protect himself and the integrity of colleagues. Um, but it, this does sort of raise huge questions, doesn't it, about what is acceptable in the theatre of war? When does actually acting in protection of your country and in, the, in service to your monarch uh, cross the line and then become uh, sort of arbitrary and brutal acts of murder and torture. And uh, th there's got to be a fine balance here between making sure we operate uh, in accordance with uh, what is expected of us internationally, legally and morally, but also protecting those who do serve their country. And the fact that here you are, a sitting MP, 10 days now to name those whistleblowers or potentially go to prison, it's... Uh... April the 5th. A lot of journalists go through this. Uh, reveal your sources. No, we won't. If you don't, you'll go to jail. Uh, Johnny Mercer finds himself in that position. He won't give up those names because that's the honourable thing to do. He's an honourable man. You don't rat on people. It's as simple as that. And I don't like a law system that tries to mm. make uh, a minister of this realm uh, be, turn into a sneak. Uh, so uh, good for Johnny Mercer. I stand with him. Uh, Shamima Begum uh, has lost an initial bid to challenge the removal of her British citizenship. She wanted to go to the uh, Supreme Court, yet removal of her British citizenship. She wanted to go to the uh, Supreme Court yet again to say, give me my citizenship back. She can't have it. Every time she does this, it costs us right. taxpayers more money. Why doesn't she go away and just learn to live with the fact she ain't ever coming back and she's not getting what her passport What I don't back. understand now about the legal system in this country is the fact that you can keep losing cases and keep appealing Healing them yeah. over and over, over again, again yeah. especially if we're funding it. I'm sorry, love. The highest court in this country said, bog off, you're not a citizen anymore. The Minister of State said, bog off, you're not a citizen anymore. Intelligence has said, you could be a danger if you come back. Bog off, you're not a citizen anymore. That should be the end of it. I don't understand why she keeps getting recourse to further and further representation. Whether you think that she should come home or not is immaterial. The decision 
has been made. I am fed up now with everything in 2024 coming down to the decision of more and more lawyers. It's a great year to be a lawyer and a bad year if you're the taxpayer funding constant litigation when it comes to political decisions. Right. Ridiculous. Let's talk about uh, John Craven. He's 83 years old, veteran BBC presenter, a scion <laughs> of uh, Country File, which is a very popular programme of a Sunday about rural areas. Uh, he says there is disturbing evidence uh, of racism in the British countryside. Uh, what evidence? Why, uh, this why is uh, absolutely you? mad. So apparently this has come as part of a report that is aiming to seek, seek to connect climate change to racism. I mean, why, even, why do that? Why has someone spent two years trying to find a connection between climate change and racism? These are people who shouldn't have jobs. Go and get a life. Of course they're not connected, you absolute morons. Um, but these part of this is spent two years trawling the countryside for evidence of racism. It's a bit like if you look for something, you're probably going to find it. Certainly it's in this country. It's utterly ridiculous. And do you know, I always find this um, proposition that uh, minorities don't want to go into nature, don't want to go hike. I mean, I think that's racist in itself. Anyone could go into the countryside. The countryside is absence of humanity. That's the point. How can no humans or any human dispositions be connected to some sort of human emotional prejudice? It is trees. It is birds. It is grass. You, you want to go me. see them? Go see them. I don't. I'll stay in the city, thank you very much. But I, I, I re reject that. What? I... You're white. You're supposed to be going hiking, you yeah, fool. Uh, what? In the countryside? I, I've never been there, but I've heard bad things. <laughs> uh, but seriously, uh, I don't believe it's racist. Uh, there are fewer people of colour in rural areas. That doesn't make it racist. I'm sick of people from the BBC just saying, you're all racist. You know, we look down on you. We're the state broadcaster. You're racist. You're Brexiteers. I'm sick to death. Why are people so and I'm surprised at John, I'm surprised that John Craven, he could well, have done better. It, Let's talk about Donald Trump. Uh, let's get down to uh, uh, business, Donald. shall we? Donald Trump in court again uh, yesterday, up against uh, Storm. Well, not up against Stormy Daniels, charged with hush money, paying $130,000 hush money to porn star Stormy Daniels. This is seen as some kind of uh, electoral interference because had people known the truth, uh, they might not have voted for him. Believe that, and you'll believe anything. Let's have a listen to Donald in action. Thank you very much, everybody. Are you getting a bad This is a witch hunt. It's a hoax. Thank you. It's a witch hunt. It's so, a hoax. I mean, he we're going through this weaponization of our government to try and knock out somebody's political opponent. And so far, based on the polls, it's not working at all. The people understand it. Uh, we have a man who just uh, ruled they'd like the trial to start in 21 days or something. And I don't know how you can have a trial that's going on right in the middle of an election. Not fair. Not fair. It's not fair at all. Uh, that, that's, uh, that's arguable. Uh, also, uh, of course, he's been facing this charge that he falsified his true wealth in order to uh, gain loans uh, for his business empire. And uh, in order to face this trial, uh, the Stormy Daniels trial, if you like, uh, he had to stump up $464 million mm. as a bond for the other trial. That amount has now been reduced to $175 million, so he now can pay the bond. So he lives to fight another day, and every day he appears in court uh, is a good day for the Republicans. The Democrats' uh, efforts to undermine this guy are failing. I mean, what's astonishing, actually, is Trump's uh, personal wealth has now been revalued. It's higher than it's ever been. He's now a sort of billionaire to the tune of about six odd billion pounds because of his uh, acquisition of a social media platform well, he and its merger. It. He, he launched um, it. Yeah, he launched it. So he's actually richer than he's ever been. And they're trying to sort of mess him around saying you falsified business accounts for loans that you paid off ages ago. I mean, if that's, that's not ridiculous most lawfare, these, I don't know what is. Most of these, but, law, most of these uh, uh, um, loans were from Deutsche Bank. Uh, but all of those loans, he's paid back. Yeah. So what are they talking about? Why are they questioning really, these? He clearly did have enough money to pay the money back because he did pay the money back. It is back. utterly so ludicrous. It's been exposed about? for exactly what it is. Um, but, you know, it's not going to work. He is going to be the next president of the United States. Put that in your pipe and smoke it, Democrats. Indeed. Uh, I think there's more uh, lawfare going on today, so we'll keep you up to speed with Donald and uh, his entertaining journey through life. Uh, but uh, let's talk about it. You could take this one, yeah. Alex, because you understand all this I stuff. do. Well, yesterday... It's ha what's been happening in Europe happened here yesterday. Uh, hundreds of tractors descended on Westminster. Yes. Angry farmers. Explain why. 
So I was there in Westminster yesterday and saw the tractors going past and I was whooping and cheering from the sidelines. Support British farmers. Absolutely, we must. Now, this is a hangover, really, of European Union membership. Farmers are utterly sick to death with having to sell whatever they produce, whether it's meat or crop, lower at the, at the farm gate, lower than it costs to actually produce it. At the same time, you've got all this sort of net zero legislation saying, oh, you can't actually farm your fields. You've got to rewild them and plant wildflowers and this, that and the other. Don't actually grow food, don't produce food, just have all the fields that you own lying completely dormant so you're all going to make less money. Then at the same time, you've got the blight of massive foreign imports, which cost far less to produce than what we produce because British farming is some of the best in the world. We have old-fashioned pastoral methods, we graze our cows outside, not in massive horrible hangars where they're sort of trussed up to giant walking machines and eat pig's brains. Well, we did invent that, didn't we? Well, I don't know who invented it. We, we did, did use, we we invent, did, we did we use some funny animal we feed in it. Concentrated but we, but, we but, but, but basically, Britain is one of the highest levels of uh, animal welfare, highest levels of not using hormones and chemicals and the trash that other countries do. And no, we do. We're we actually that great. have. We're not no, that we great. do. I know a thing or two about this. And we actually so have some I. of the <laughs> highest agricultural standards in the world and some of the best yeah, quality produce. That, the problem we have <laughs> in this day and age is everybody wants to eat things for less than the cost of production. Production. If you actually look at the cost of, say, a chicken back in 1940 compared to now and actually offset it against inflation, it was far more expensive back then because, do you know what? People buy a chicken and feed a family for a week. Now people want to buy a pack of eight chicken breasts, eat two, throw the rest away. They're lazy, they're feckless, they're greedy, they're getting fat, they don't know how to cook properly. And we need to protect our farmers because if we don't, and if we kill off agriculture in this country, we will be in trouble. It's a huge security risk. Don't you care about the lazy fat food. people who don't care how to cook properly? Don't you care about them? Well, they'd be less fat and less lazy than you. Leave them cook. alone. If they, they can be lazy, fat, and well, not fine, but I just think I just think food should cost the cost the, the, the amount it costs to produce. We do need to protect our farmers. Anyway, by, by the way, you mentioned you mentioned, you mentioned you uh, mentioned Keir Starmer. Uh, he learned yesterday that his net zero policies. Guess how much they're going to cost? I'm just throwing this in. We're not going to discuss it, but we might later. 116 billion pounds. So that's not going to work, is it? Unbelievable. Not Mind work. you, he's going to be prime minister soon, and. Maybe he'll go grey because Rishi is going grey since uh, taking over at number 10. Look, there he is, jet black hair on the left. Look at all that grey coming in. Uh, there's no doubt about Look at that. He's What's going he got? pretty he got, like, bad. He's squash goggles on. Yeah, but he's going like very white to uh, fleck in mm. there, isn't he? Uh, and uh, we've had a look at some other prime ministers as well. Uh, I think we've got Blair. Let's have a look at some of them. Look at Blair. Wow, look at, look know, how much he ate. Look, on the right, he's happens. young. On the, Look at these wow. people. So they're getting older towards the left, I think. You can see the Gordon Brown there. And oh, there's spade. David Spade Face. His old Cameron, Spade Face of Sheeping Norton. He's busy now, uh, of course, uh, conducting our foreign policy with no reference to the Prime Minister at no all. No accountability. It's an absolute travesty. Well, there you are, Prime Ministers. Going into number 10 will almost kill you, as Boris Johnson himself would testify. Yeah, he could, but we couldn't tell he was going bald. <laughs> I always thought he was going bald. I still think he is. But we'll look into that later, <laughs> I promise you. Uncle Stop. Sadly, though, Alex, we've come to the end of this show. Thank you for tuning in. You know what to do at one o'clock. You don't want to miss it. It's going to be full of intense investigations and opinion. Oh, what's this? Slow cross talk? I think it's uh, Peter Carbwell next. Flying cross talk. Hey, very good morning to you. Thanks for joining us. You're with Talk TV on TV, on radio, online. And we're on your smart speaker. Now, you ain't going to happen and eve it, me old Chinas, but a new report is calling for a new definition of cockney. All right, Jeremy, me old China. Rosie. Right, oi, oi, treat girl. When J.K. Rowling says, let's just be honest, that's all she's saying, let's just be honest, when a man goes out and kills, we should talk about them as what they are, a biological man. Trans woman, it's not a woman, trans woman. Is a man. Lee would have to go for much further than his statement. I mean, he, he did say that he spoke clumsily and he understood the Prime Minister's position, but I think he'd need to say that he'd got it wrong. Then I had a phone call this morning um, from Kim City Council, a lovely woman called Anna. And yeah, I've just received an email just saying um, that, yeah, I'm going to be getting a badge. Quite um, right, too. Yeah. Quite yeah. right, too. Yeah. It's that time again to get the violins out. That's right. Prince Harry has lost his bid for UK security after moaning 
he'd been singled out. Now you might as well be discussing an invasion of Daleks for all I really get this. <laughs> but, but, but I am now on social media having been dragged off my eight pound Nokia reluctantly kicking and screaming. <laughs> I'm a huge hit on Instagram, as you probably know. What are you doing? I'm just about to do it. Ooh! Ooh! It's carry on what just happened. <laughs> Whoa, <listen. laughs> there was a suggestion by some that maybe it would nice to put a statue of the